Hello and welcome to Coffee with Cafe. I'm Chef Kirk Bachman and I serve as the president of Augusta Scoffier School of Culinary Arts. Escoffier is proud and honored to partner with CAFE in hosting these trends presentations, which help fulfill CAFE's mission of linking the food service classroom with the food service industry. Augusta Escoffier School of Culinary Arts is a learning community, and our goal is to help prepare students for exciting and satisfying careers in the culinary and hospitality industries. We do this by providing professional programs which are focused on sustainability, farm to table philosophy, and business operations. Students who choose to study with Escoffier are offered an accredited education through the flexibility of two residential campuses or online programs. So thank you again for joining us today and please enjoy this week's presentation. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Chef Paul, are you there also? Chef, how you doing? I'm to see great, you. I'm great. So let's kick this off. And, um, you know, first of all, I wanna thank everybody who's, who's joined us today, uh, especially on kind of a holiday Friday, um, to, um, to, to talk about the future of culinary education. Where are we going? And just listen to two guys who've been doing it for a long time. and. I think that's kind of the point of this, because this is the thing, right? We all know that culinary education um, is changing. Uh, the food service industry has had uh, a bunch of curveballs thrown at it in this last year with the pandemic and even before that, but the pandemic has just sped everything up. And I think we have to talk about, you know, where are we going to go with culinary education? What does the future look like? How has this pandemic maybe changed things or not? And really just about how do we change and how do we go from here? Today is not about, you know, we have all the answers. I mean, maybe Paul does. I don't know. But, you know, we're going to find out. But it's really about, you know, a conversation. And it's a conversation between the two of us. And then we would love to have you ask questions and sort of join into that conversation at the end of this. Because hopefully what we talk about maybe is... Maybe it's inspirational. Maybe there are some solutions. Maybe it just is thought provoking and you walk away from this kind of going, hmm, I wonder if that's something we have to think about. So with that, Paul, would you like to introduce yourself and then I'll introduce myself? Oh, sure. Well, <clears throat> you know, Chris, I'm, uh, I, I still say I'm a chef, even though I've been out of the kitchen for quite a while. Um, you know, I've been an executive chef. I've been in culinary education. Um, I spent 30 years in culinary education from the instructor level up to vice president of a college. Um, and then in 2012, I, I thought maybe now's the time to break off on my own and see if I can help some other folks. So I started a consulting business called Harvest America Ventures. Uh, and along with that, Harvest America Cues, my blog, which now has uh, close to 2 million views. Um, and we also do... Uh, Cafe Talks podcast uh, for Cafe, which is which has been great. It's been a thrill for me to talk to some really accomplished individuals. So, so that's me in a nutshell. Well, and I have to say, I was on one of your podcasts, so that was it was a blast. So uh, I'm I'm Chris Ketke, and um, it's you know my background is also um, started as a chef. You know, I walked into my first kitchen over four decades ago, and uh, was in the world of fine dining. Then took a little detour into culinary education. Uh, that wound up lasting for 20 years and uh, started here at Kendall College in Chicago uh, as an instructor also, and then sort of finished as, as vice president. And also uh, of our global operations, Kendall at that time was part of a larger international entity. And so I was looking after 48 campuses uh, in 12 countries. Left that three years ago, started my own consulting company called The Culinary, uh, and then sort of fell into this wonderful um, challenge of the Sun Valley Culinary Institute, where uh, I am now helping to get that program up and running in Idaho and serve as its Dean of Curriculum. So um, that's what that's what I do. And uh, also work with some other companies as well. So with that, I think what we want to really do today is to talk about um, where we're going, you know, and and sort of this 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 dialogue. So, so Paul, I'm going to kick it off. And you know, talk a little bit about technology, right? 
and where things are going from a technological standpoint. And I'm going to preface this by saying that, you know, in the last few years, I've gone through kind of an educational metamorphosis in my head, you know, maybe call it evolution, whatever. And one of those things was, you know, for so many years, I was like, you can't do online. It's, it's impossible. And all this technology stuff, you have to be teaching in person. You have to, you know, and um, in, in this pandemic, uh, I have wound up uh, actually doing Zoom cooking classes uh, for high school students. Just last week, I did a, a Zoom cooking class with 35 chefs uh, with the Research Chef Association. And, you know, all of a sudden I've had that change in my brain that says, wait a minute, I, I think there's a lot more going on here and a lot more possibilities than I personally ever thought there was. But Paul, what do you think? Where, where are we going with this? Well, you know, we live in an anytime world. Um, you know, people, they want to do business on their own schedules now, not on somebody else's. So this whole world of uh, mass customization has been going on for a couple decades now. And people have learned to expect that, that uh, we as business people will adapt to their particular needs, not vice versa. Um, I think there's a, there's a growing space for online. Uh, you know, I would, I would say that I'm probably in the same court as you. There was, there was a period of time when I was very resistant to the whole online model. It, it absolutely couldn't work in culinary education. <laughs> but the reality is that the technology gets better all the time. And the only thing that is lacking in making culinary education exceptional is our involvement. So we are the ones that if we adapt, if we are adept at making change, we are the ones that can continue to uh, help this, this, this methodology evolve and become better. So, um, you know, people also have this, this need to know. And I, and I think um, I, I was reflecting the other day on um, a couple chef instructors that I know who were adamant that students were not allowed to bring their cell phones into the kitchen. <laughs> but this is, it's a travesty to allow students to do this. It's a diversion. It shouldn't be allowed. It's the sin of mankind. And the reality is this is how students communicate. This is how people communicate today. And rather than resist, if we figured out a way to engage that technology in what we do, uh, I mean, just from a marketing standpoint for schools, you know, the, the fact that students are taking pictures of their work and posting it on Instagram and on Facebook, that gets your name out, that gets your, your vision out of what your school is all about. And it creates excitement for the students. Um, but this whole attitude of, you know, I, I have to be able to know what's going on. I have to have answers to questions. They are sitting in your hand. Uh, so I, I would say, yes, technology, yes, adapt to this. And yes, let's throw away those those old resistance uh, genes that come into play that say we can't or we shouldn't or we won't. You know, there's two things on that cell phone thing that, that I find funny. First of all, my, my daughter at one point, I remember saying to her like, what are you doing? You need to be working on your homework. You know, she's on her phone, right? My immediate thought is, you know, she's goofing around, right? She's like, I am doing my homework on my phone. I'm like, no, yeah, I mean, right there, you know, on the phone. So, you know, it is it is amazing what cell phones, um, can do. I mean, frankly, they're, they're mini computers, right? It's also a little bit fearful. If you're, if you're that instructor and you're teaching, you know that they can Google what you just said, right? And be like, no, actually, that's not true. So it also holds us pretty accountable. You know, I think the thing that, that I find amazing in the whole technological space is, you know, when it started, um, you know, it was okay. I mean, frankly, we were a little bit sort of handcuffed by the technology, call it, you know, bandwidth, call it the, you know, quality of the camera, um, call it, you know, storage and, and what that costs, et cetera, and how to move data around. And that was all, you know, harder and frankly, not so great. Where today, I'm amazed, um, you know, when the, when the pandemic started, I was started shooting videos here in, in my home, you know, with a cell phone. And I'm like, that's just impossible. That's, you can't do that. It was it was amazing, but I will also say, Paul. I think I think the caveat in all of this is, is that you know while things are getting better, you know 
I found personally, you do still need, you got to bring in the experts, the experts on the, on the technology side to, because look, we're chefs, right? You know, but you bring in those, those experts and I've done that. Um, people who live in that world and they have helped me truly up the game. So, you know, it's not, I mean, I can do the teaching part. I can do the culinary part, but they've helped me make that connection and understand how to do it really, really well in a really quality sense. So who knows where the future is. The the reverse is, the reverse is true too. You can help technology people deliver the content the way you envision it to be. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny, you know, I was, again, I was resistant and now I'm really excited to see where this goes because there's no doubt in my mind, there are some super smart people at MIT or wherever who already are, you know, 10 years ahead of us in terms of what's possible. And I, I don't know, I'd love to, you know, Paul, I'd love to revisit this in like a year or two and just be like, you know, where are we? Because I, I think it's going to be incredible. We're all going to have, you know, cameras on our heads so we can actually follow what's, you know, and you put sort of that, that gimbal technology there. So it's not quite so, you know, jerky, et cetera. Um, sure. Imagine, I mean, that could be incredible. So anyways, um, we only have 20 minutes. I think we could talk about technology for hours, but let's, let's for talk sure. about yeah. sort of alternative models, you know, because, I, you know, I, I will say that um, I, I've, you know, had a lot of thinking time and, you know, I wonder about where we're going in terms of, a, a, you know, culinary education as a whole, right? I mean, you know, we all know the history, you know, it's, we all kind of jumped into this very academic model of doing things, um, you know, connected to institutions built within universities, you know, part of the higher learning stuff, Um and I, and I, I wonder, you know, I mean, we've, we've seen some cracks in that foundation um, and we've seen society and even food service sort of push back against that pretty hard. And it's made me really think about how to do things differently, better, you know, et cetera. So I don't know, thoughts, where, where are we going with this? I mean, does the model of culinary education as we have known it, is that the model we see five years from now? Again, I, I reflect back to that concept of uh, mass customization. You know, there's, uh, there's two ways to look, I think, two ways to look at where, where the model is going to go. One, you can look back, for instance, uh, apprenticeship program, which I think uh, has viability again. All of a sudden, everyone's talking about apprenticeship, and there's, there's a reason for that. You know, who's, who's better positioned to really teach the repetitive nature of skill development than operations that are busy, right? And, uh, you know, years and years ago, most hotels, most resorts did their own training. So if you wanted to become a chef, you start off as a dishwasher, then a breakfast cook, then a prep cook and a line cook and so on. And because they were positioned to do that, to rotate people around. So we can always look back, but we can also look forward uh, because, uh, and again, this is personal opinion, Chris, because, you know, some people may disagree, but, you know, I'm going to talk about the sacrilege and the sacrilege is the question, do we always need a degree? Because uh, in the future, we might be looking at stackable certificates. We might be looking at certifications rather than certificates or degrees. We might be looking at hybrids. We might be looking at short residencies for programs. We might be looking at non-credit programs. We might be looking at uh, lifelong learning where a student engages with you, with your institution for their career. And they learn these different snippets along the way as they progress through their career. So I, I, I think all of that in, involves you know, our, our willingness to adapt to technology and to put aside those sacred cows and say, well, this is the way it always has to be. Um, you know, and, and, and of course, one of the culprits there is state education departments, which are typically very inflexible uh, when it comes to deciding what you need to offer, you know, a certain percentage in this and a certain percentage of that. But I think we need to stand up and say, you know, this is what we see as being right. And this is what industry tells us they need. And this is what our customers, our students are interested in buying. That's super interesting um, because 
You know, I would agree with you. And and again, I'm you know speaking very much from a personal standpoint here. By the way, Paul, you're supposed to be drinking coffee during this. I'm just saying, you know, coffee with cafe oh. water is it's not water with cafe. I just just a, a point. You, you don't <laughs> you, you don't want to you don't want to see me on coffee, right? <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I I think that that you know you you again we could talk for hours on this because I I think you're right. You know, I. You know, I was very much in that, you know, that academic model. And where my head is gone is, is that, you know, there's nothing wrong with education per se. There's nothing wrong with an associate's degree, bachelor's degree beyond, right? There is a Correct. value right. to education. There's an intrinsic value to education. You know, even to things like the gen ed classes that people don't always, you know, want to take. But at the same time, I also believe that that one size fits all model um, is, is, is not actually where the future is. You know, I, I, I think there will always be some of that, but I also think to your point, we've got to re-envision this because we've seen that that model doesn't serve everybody well. And then you, you layer on top of that things like, you know, expensive programs, um, you layer on top of that, you know, are people truly, you know, to your point, repetition, are they really ready for the industry? And what exactly are we preparing? And is everybody an academic learner? And I think that we all know that that's, you know, not the case, right? So I, I think, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, I'm working with this, this you know, Sun Valley Culinary Institute out in, in Idaho. And, you know, it's a little program, but it's something I'm really excited about because we actually are doing something very different. And, you know, we, we chose not to be an academic institution. We've, we've, to your point, we've looked back and we've said, let's look at that apprenticeship model. And instead of having, you know, a degree, an associate's degree, you're going to have a journey person certificate from the U.S. Department of Labor. Totally different model. But it really is that bouncing back and forth between, you know, learning on site and working Um and going, you know, again, it's that it's that back and forth thing that allows somebody to get foundational stuff, but then also really know how to work in the industry um, in a short period of time and inexpensive. I mean, I think this is all stuff that has to be learned. And I'm going to throw one more thing out, and I'd love to get your feedback on that, which is I think there's also a bigger role for industry. You know, you talk about the way it used to be. I know that there are large entities out there, food service entities, who are kind of saying, to your point, how do we bring this in house? How do we do like our own, you know, sort of little culinary school? I mean, I was on a call yesterday with a resort um, environment, and that, that's exactly what they were asking: is how how do we do this? How do we how do we train people? How do we teach people? Again, apprenticeship model maybe, so that they stick around. Anyways, what what are your thoughts? Well, well, here here's a radical thought. You know, if you know if, if this whole um, um, event today is is designed to get people to think a little bit differently. Um, you know, one of the one of the the difficult things about running a culinary program now is the sheer cost of doing so. Um, you know, the, the physical plant is is very expensive. Uh, the student to faculty ratio is different than pretty much any other program except maybe med school. Um, so, you know, from a from an administrative standpoint at a college. Uh, you really got to think about whether or not you want to have a culinary program because it's just expensive to deliver. Uh, what if what if schools um, became institutions without borders, without a facility, but uh, they exported their faculty and their expertise and their curriculum uh, to, to large organizations, to resorts, to um, um, destination hotels, to to companies? And say we're we're going to be we're going to deliver that education that you need to your people while they're working, uh, and you're going to earn whatever it is a certificate, a certification, degree, in the process. And at the same time, the school doesn't have to worry about uh, the cost of a physical plant, updating equipment, and all, and all those kind of uh, roadblocks that we face. Well, you know, I will say that that's that was sort of the discussion we we're having yesterday, but. You know, and again, this was in the context of what we're doing in Idaho, you know, the Sun Valley Culinary Institute. But that was like small school, but the employers sending their people to us for small pieces of time then going back to work. 
So in essence, yeah, you keep your costs down. You don't need this enormous facility, but it does allow you to continue to teach and it's in a partnership with industry. But I think this is the, you know, I, I think to your point, everything you said at the beginning of this with, the, with all the different options, I think any institution that's currently teaching culinary, you've got to look at that. How do you do lifelong learning? How do you do it in little pieces? How do you maybe recognize that people can't stop what they're doing for two or four years? And, and how do you make it affordable and actionable and so that they're ready to go? You know, we're just about out of time. This is like so fast, 20 minutes. But I do say, and I just want to throw one thing out and then we can open it up for questions. Um, but that is, I, you know, as you know, I've done a lot of work with sustainability through the years. And I would, I would say that, and again, personal opinion, culinary education has done a great job in management techniques, okay? In other words, you know, if you go back 30, 40 years, the kitchens were brutal places to work in. I mean, I know, I was there. And, you know, culinary education has changed the way I think that management happens and people are smarter about it. And it's not that, you know, dog eat dog world so much. That's a positive. It's broken that cycle, that abusive cycle. But I think that where culinary education maybe still needs to really think about this is in two areas. As we prepare people for the future, number one, are we really preparing them for a world where sustainability becomes more and more important? Big question, soul searching, right? And the other thing is, are we really preparing people to go into the industry and change the industry in terms of how we treat people fairly, you know, living wages, all of that, and that's a huge question, you know, healthcare, are we actually, are we actually seeding that change? And that's something I wonder about. Paul, I don't know if you have a quick question on that or a quick thought, then we can open up to questions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I look at sustainability in a bunch of different ways. You know, there's, there's the save the planet aspect of sustainability that we're, we're all beginning to embrace. But then there's also the sustainability when it comes to the industry. You know, we, we can, we cannot, as an industry, continue to work on a model that yields five to six percent profit if you do everything right. It's just not sustainable. Uh, and we've seen that now with the pandemic, where I mean, restaurants, uh, you know, three weeks after the shutdown started, uh, they said we got to throw in the towel. We we can't survive. Uh, so we have to work on that. And and if we work on that, and as an educational institution if we help our industry figure out a way to work on that, then we can start to set the stage for better wages, better working conditions, better quality of life, and all those things that, that are so important to today's employees and tomorrow's employees. Couldn't agree more. So we're out of time. Um, now for, there are 36 people who have joined us here today. And um, what we were told is we can stick around and, and do some Q and A here. So we're gonna do that. If you need to jump off, by all means, feel like you know, feel free to do so. I would say that you know, just as a quick wrap up to this, um, you know, adaptability, flexibility, those are hugely important things. And I also would, you know, Paul, and, and I'm gonna ask Mary about this, but maybe there's a maybe there's a forum within Cafe to continue this discussion, to continue it online with other educators around the country, you know, because. These are unprecedented times that we live in, and I think they will continue to be, hopefully differently and not pandemic focused. But culinary education, I think personally, is at a crossroads. And I think we have to embrace change and we have to do it in a bold way, but that's gonna take a lot of smart people. So anyways, I'd love to continue that discussion. I don't know, Paul, if you're up for that, but we can do martinis with cafe, six o'clock. <laughs> sure, that sounds good. Santa. You provide the booze. I'm on side. I'm with you. Uh, so, so show, should we, we read some of these questions and, and try and address them? Yeah, let's do this. So I have one here. Um, so how do you think the next year of, of probably dramatic changes within the hospitality, uh, within hospitality as things to come, as things come back online will impact what we do? Um, how can we be better positioned to serve their needs? So in other words, uh, yeah, so, so everybody knows that, you know, the restaurant hospitality industry has been, you know, decimated. But, you know, and Paul, we were talking about this this morning, actually, about, you know, I believe that things are going to come back um, very much like they were as long as the pandemic, you know, sort of ends. And there's going to be a huge, huge desire for people to go out to eat. But how, how, what do you think? I mean, how can culinary schools, 
you know, culinary programs be best suited to serve that world? I, you know, I, I think it, it has to be a symbiotic relationship. You know, the, um, the question is not just how can we serve them better, but how can they also serve us better? Um, you know, I, I work with, with a lot of restaurants and universally, every restaurant I work with is crying for employees. They're crying for people. They need people. So, you know, through our internship and externship models, we have the ability to do that. But at the same time, um, restaurants and hotels and resorts need to step up and, and help us to do a better job of cha- training through that repetitive model that builds skills. So it has to be, there has to be relationship building there. And now is the best time to start that because if this pandemic does really come at least close to an end by the summer or shortly thereafter, um, you know, they're going to need, they're going to need folks and, and we're going to need training. So this is the time to sit down at the table and start to talk about those issues. I agree completely. You know, I think that for a long time, the industry was sort of kind of in an advisory role a little bit like, you know, we're going to do our thing over here in culinary education. We'll interact with you a little bit and maybe talk to you about, you know, taking our externs and that sort of thing. But I, I really, to your point, ask the, the question if we truly had that relationship with industry and, and not just, you know, sort of an occasional meeting or whatever, but, a, but really guiding and really partnering, a truly a partnership, an industry education partnership. Um, and I think that's where we have to go because I also would throw into that mix that we don't, we don't know where the future does go. I think the one thing the pandemic has taught us is, you know, bad stuff can happen, unpredictable stuff can happen and happen on a, on a truly a massive scale. And, you know, how do we, how do we keep those industry relationships alive so that when change happens, because it will, that we have that strong communication. So we know in, in a, the educational world, how to work with them and they know how to work with us because it really is a one, two step process. So um, what do you think the role of virtual education could play within the apprenticeship model? That's to you, Paul. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, again, we talk about this, this cell phone and we talk about uh, the value of online education. You know, uh, on the job training uh, is ultimately important in developing skills, but there's a lot more that goes into the knowledge that is necessary to become a proficient cook and eventually a chef than just working with our hands and, and, and being adept at, at producing product. Uh, so, you know, in a, a modern day apprenticeship program, wouldn't it, uh, technology uh, be a great partner in this whole process? Uh, couldn't we deliver a lot of that um, theoretical content, uh, you know, via online classes, but also just short little quips on the cell phone here, you know, uh, as a resource. You know, again, you know, we use use the tools that we have. These are incredible tools and everybody has one of these in their pocket. How can we incorporate this into our educational model? This is not something that gets in our way. This is something that we have that can really service our needs and our and our clients needs. In this case, our students. Well, and I would also add to that, that, you know, if we go to sort of that, you know, industry and education partnership, and that's really what apprenticeship is. Um, you know, I think as many of us have learned, people who run restaurants, you know, kitchens, hotels, whatever, um, are really good at what they do. They're good operators in theory, right? And they know how to, you know, produce a certain number of meals in a certain amount of time at a certain price and all that. What a lot of them aren't good at is education. I mean, they're good at sort of training in their environment, but that's where it sort of falls short after that. In other words, they're not going to take the time to explain to somebody the whys, the bigger picture, the repertoire, the, you know, there's dry heat cooking and moist heat cooking. They're not going to go into that. They're going to go into what they need to do for their operation. And so I think that where the virtual piece can come in a little bit to Paul's point is we can give structure to the practical experience that they're getting. 
And again, I, I, I'm more and more interested in this model of sort of toggling back and forth between, you know, what we do in a, in a classroom and educational setting and what happens on an, in an industry setting. Because when the two can work hand in hand, I think that that has the potential for great education. In addition to that, I also think, you know, going to your cell phone piece, there's also a huge need to educate the people who are, you know, the, the managers about how to maybe better educate their students. And that also could be done digitally. So, um, okay. Uh, we got some things here about people want to do martinis. Great. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see. Uh, I'm teaching culinary both online and in person. How do you see online instructors assessing the skill sets and final product of students when they need to cook when they need to cook to show their skill sets? Photos and videos are good, but there is also the question of taste and texture. This cannot be done online. So where do you see this segment of the teaching process going if we move to online instruction or instruction for culinary schools? Many students do not have the funds to procure their own product to complete cooking assignments. Wow, there's a lot there. Um, <laughs> Paul, before you before you go there, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that uh, I had a had an interesting experience um, in the last month or so, and that was um, through some. Anyways, but you know, there's I was sort of asked by an by an organization that does high school competitions um, about how they can judge. You know, and, and, and it was really interesting because it was about, it actually started with a conversation about how do we do this from a video standpoint? You know, because I've done a lot of television in my, in my past. And so we, we actually shot a video for them about how the student competitors can shoot their video of themselves competing. So it wasn't about like cooking skills and all that. It was really just about the, 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 uh, the sort of technological standpoint from a filming, you know, lighting, et cetera. But what was really interesting is as we were working on this, it was like, well, wait a minute, why are they doing this? Well, they're doing it so that the judges are empowered to see what they're doing. And that sort of became the focus of the video. In other words, we need to see you chop stuff. We need to see you wash your hands. We need to all that. But when it got to the final product, you know, taste is, is, is always an issue. Although I would say, interestingly enough, that I, when you watch them cook, you have a general sense for where things are going. Like for instance, if they never taste their product, we got a problem. Or you see them, you know, season and you, you know, like, oh, that was way too much salt. Or they only put like a pinch of salt into like three gallons of soup, et cetera. I mean, it's, is it perfect? No. But from a textural standpoint, what we had them do is kind of interesting. They did chicken breasts and mashed potatoes as part of their competition. So I said, I want a close up of you stirring those mashed potatoes or kind of manipulating them on the plate so I can actually see the texture. I want to see you slice the chicken breast and I want a close up on the chicken breast to gauge like, does it, is it juicy, et cetera. And when you poke that thermometer in, I want to see a close up. And we told them all to get digital thermometers. I want you to see a close-up so I can see the final temperature on that thermometer. So it, it was interesting. I mean, we're getting closer. I mean, is it is it the same as being in a kitchen? No. I think there's still value to being in a kitchen, certainly. But I think it's sort of that, again, there's, I think, space for both or both in tandem. Paul? Well, you know, far be it for me to to give pointers on, on how to assess an online model, but there are um, schools out there that are doing a very good job with it. I mean, the Escoffier School is one, is, is um, focused a lot on online education, and Ruby, another great example. Uh, I'm sure they have some, some great pointers on how to, how to assess that. The other piece, um, though, is the logistics piece of you know, students being able to afford to purchase their own ingredients and how do you get those ingredients to them and how do you make sure that they're the right ingredients. And, and I would say there's room for schools to now start carrying on a dialogue with uh, third party providers, you know, you know, why not contact somebody like Blue Apron, who is who has the infrastructure in place to be able to do this and say, you know, we want here's here's a list of people. 
it's built in their their tuition to cover the cost of this you build the school for that and those those supplies get delivered to that student i think there's uh we don't have to reinvent the wheel we don't have to do everything there are other partners out there that that can help there is however um and I, I think this ties into that question. You know, we can teach, I believe, with great technology, we can teach people to cook. But can we teach people to become a cook? And there is a real distinction there because one of the, the things that's lacking with technology that somehow or other has to be incorporated elsewhere is sense of urgency and teamwork. You know, working together on a line with, three other people that have different stations and listening to the expediter and getting those finished plates up in the, in the, in the pass before they're picked up. I mean, those kinds of things uh, for the life of me, I can't envision how that could be taught one-on-one -on -one using technology. So this is where, you know, those models with hybrid activity comes into play, you know, so maybe there's uh, the teaching to cook, type of aspect, which is done online. And then there's those short residencies a couple times a year where students have to be on campus for two or three weeks and it's really intensive. Uh, or maybe it's that model of, of, of online with an apprenticeship segment. So they're out in the industry and they're working at the same time. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of went off in different directions but I think that's a, that's a great question. It's the how to, you know, okay, we're, if we can all agree that this is something we have to entertain how do you really do it well? Yep. Boy, now we're getting tons of questions in here. We could be here for hours. <laughs> so um, so there's there's a couple of questions here just about changing the industry and how we, you know, I, I, I sort of said, are we doing enough to, to really educate people on, on, you know, how we create a more, a, a more fair and frankly attractive industry when it comes to wages and healthcare and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm just going to sort of say that I, I, I don't think that there is a, a, you know, you do this and then you do this and you do this. I don't think it's that simple. I think it's a, it's a long-term um, change, you know, because we have an industry that is locked into a certain way of doing things. But I think that there are, there is momentum now to look at that. And I think that we and what we can do in culinary schools within, you know, educational format is to really engage that conversation to help people think about, you know, what are the forces that keep things where they are and how do you go about changing those? You know, Paul and I were talking earlier about this and it was like, you know, what is the role of technology, you know, so that we can actually keep costs at a certain, you know, in line so that we can maybe increase, you know, you know, labor, it's or not labor amounts, but, you know, but, but salaries, et cetera. I mean, there's, you know, what do we need to do to embrace healthcare? for everybody in the health in, in our in our industry. Those are big topics, but I think where this where this gets going, in my opinion, is is having very open and frank discussions about that. And the fact that this is a this is a direction we as we as an industry, in my opinion, we need to go. And how do we get there? And how can you one day be that change? Just like when we teach about sustainability. I mean when we started talking about sustainability, you know, it was a process. And today, a lot of people are talking about it and going, we need to do something different here. And we're looking at the, the next generation as the leaders to really carry that message forward. Um, I don't know. I, I just think that that's, I think that's kind of what needs to be done right now. It needs to be a focus, um, but it's not going to happen immediately. I don't know if you agree, Paul, on that. I, uh, for sure. Absolutely. And it won't happen immediately, but, but we can help as educators. Yep. Um, question here. Do you think that there's a, um, a, a market for master's and doctoral level opportunities in the field of culinary and culinary education? That's to you, Paul. That's to me. Yeah, um, of course. <laughs> uh, I mean, of course, you know, the, you know, I, I think so many culinary schools, uh, the ones that I ran uh, as well, that focus on fine dining, they focus on full service restaurants, and to, for the most part, ignore a lot of those other broader topics, those other broader career options that are out there uh, that involve food. So 
is, is there, is there room for that? Of course. Is there room for research and development? Is there room for, uh, for writing? Is there room for, uh, product development? You know, there's, there's, there's a slew of other opportunities for people to pursue. Um, and certainly education never hurts. Education always opens doors for people. So, you know, don't, don't misconstrue the fact that I said, uh, before, you know, do we really always need a degree? The, the, the caveat there is always, because there are opportunities for people to be very effective in, the, in this industry without a degree, and there are other opportunities for people to do so with a master's degree or a doctoral degree. So yeah, I, I, I certainly think if, if, I were, if I were 21 years old, I'd probably be looking at a way to, to, to enhance my education that way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe differ a little bit with you on that because um, I think it's all about expectation and what that degree does for you. Um, if you think that somehow getting a master's degree or a doctorate degree will improve your kitchen performance and will make uh, somebody really want to hire you more to, to be on the line, absolutely not. Um, and, and that even goes, Paul, to your question earlier, is a degree really needed? And I, I that's something I, I, <laughs> I ask that question a lot because I'm not so sure it does. I mean, at the end of the day, for, for working chefs, it's about can you do it, not what is your degree. But that's not to say that there aren't sort of those crossover things where having a master's degree in food history or in, you know, food writing or something might be good if that's where you see your, your passions and that's where you see yourself going. Right. I just think it's critical that we're really honest that this does not improve your employment options when you, when you're, if, if you want to be kind of the working chef. So, um, and there we, I need to wrap this up pretty soon here. Let's see. The pandemic is making our understanding of agriculture, food, and culinary process. Do you see ways to incorporate the culture and history of food into how new chefs and cooks will work? How do we teach critical thinking? That's like a whole conference in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, um, this ahead, I, I, I want to preface this by saying this, this question came from Jeff Roberts, who is, he's just an incredible teacher with a great mind and, and tremendous focus on the history of food. So if you want somebody to carry on a conversation with you about food history, this is the guy you want to chat with. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Wow, how much time do we have? Number one, uh, I'm a firm believer, always have been, that uh, the best Italian food is made by an Italian grandmother who grew up in Italy and you know had a family of 10 kids and was in the kitchen all the time standing over the saw. Um, and you can't replace that. Um, you, you just can't. Uh, so anyone that a attempts to be authentic in their cooking, um, must have some type of background in the history and the culture of whatever that cuisine is. Um, you know, I, I always use the example of uh, Rick Bayless from Frontera Grill in Chicago. And, and Rick and his wife uh, spent seven years living in Mexico, um, you know, interacting with Mexican people, learning about their culture, working with their indigenous ingredients before he dared come to Chicago and open up a restaurant that became, in many people's minds, one of the most authentic Mexican restaurants in North America. Um, he's not Mexican, that's not his cultural background, but he invested the time to make sure that, that he understood that. So, um, you know, and, you know, and the same, same time, you know, how can you really respect a carrot that you're working with in the kitchen unless you've been out in the fields and you pull that carrot out of the ground and dust the dirt off of it? You know what I mean? So. Uh, you know, how, how do you do this? Um, I don't know, but it's essential. I do know that, you know, whether it's, it's a, a hands-on uh, approach towards it, or it's, it's integrated classwork, or it's, it's um, you know, history and culture across the curriculum. So that, you know, whenever you're talking about a particular style of cooking, it has to include somehow or other um, a background in that culture. Um, very important. I'm not even going to approach the critical thinking one because, <laughs> again, we could spend hours talking about that. Yes, we could. You know, I, I think that for me, um, I think it's about exciting passions. And, you know, we always talk about that lifelong learner piece, right, um, which is, is essential. And, and, you know, if you are a lifelong learner, you're lifelong curious. 
And I, I think that one of the roles that we have in education is, is sort of getting those passions excited. You know, I mean, I think about the model we've created in, in, you know, in Idaho is that on Saturday, so we, when they're with us during the week, it's five days a week, you know, in the kitchen, um, you know, before they go out on their, on their work experiences. But on Saturdays, we're going to take them into the fields. We're going to, you know, it's really interesting. Close to Sun Valley, there's so much agriculture and really interesting stuff, which I didn't know about. Um, so, you know, we'll go talk to somebody who's raising cattle. We'll go talk to people who are in the sheep business. We're going to go to, you know, massive hothouse operations. I mean, on and on and on. Um, you know, morel picking is like unbelievable in, in, well, in a couple of months. So that's, you know, and I think the thing is, is that when you go out and you stand in a field and you have the person raising these cattle talk to you about breeds of cattle and what they're eating and all this, that gets people interested. And hopefully, hopefully that kind of turns on a gene that's like, I just want to keep learning about this stuff. And they continue that throughout their whole, their whole professional career. And on the history side, same thing. I mean, if you look in my, you know, culinary library, I, I collect old books, like old cookbooks. And I, what I find so fascinating is, is, you know, things are cyclical. And also that, you know, we can get lulled into believing that we live in this time where we are so smart and we have the best of the best. And, you know, this is like this, this, this moment in time that's so incredible. And actually, no, we're just in sort of this long line of culinary tradition. And we're going to make our mark. And then it's going to continue on. And in 100 years, somebody's going to look back and chuckle at what we did. You know, and this is how things go. And so I, I think that to, to teach somebody about the, the, the importance of history and actually to get inspired by history you know i i did a i did a meal recently it was a it was a fundraiser and the woman i was gonna a long story but i wound up cooking a dish for her that is like arch classical french food and i'm like no one's gonna like this i mean it was arch classical right that was their favorite dish of the night and it just made me kind of go huh you know there is value to knowing that historical piece but Anyways, I think we probably need to wrap this up. Um, I would, by the way, just as a, a plug, I would love it if, you know, go check us out at Sun Valley Culinary, um, dot org, uh in Idaho. Just take a look at what we're doing. Again, it's kind of a, it, I think we're very, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've created out there. And I think it's maybe a way to start thinking about how to do things differently. But I really would love to continue this conversation somehow because there are so many smart people, you know, who have joined us today. And I'd love to learn more about what you're doing and, and maybe how we as a collective entity of people look to the future and we become the agents of change. So, Paul? For sure. Um, again, thanks to everybody for, for tuning in. You never know with these types of activities if you're gonna have anyone respond to it. And it's very uh, very healthy conversation, even though it's it seems one-sided. There's some great questions here. and. And uh, I know I've, I've learned a lot from this session as well. Likewise. So thank you. So back to our, our people at, at Cafe International, uh, back to the head offices of the International uh, Cafe. <laughs> and with that, I wish everybody a really, really great weekend. Uh, thank you so much. And Paul, thanks. Yeah, have, it's always fun talking with you. Yeah. Always. Have a great Easter. <laughs>